I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to the conversation with Al McFarland. Today is Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Uh, I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along as well. Uh, we always want to begin the program, the conversation with Al McFarland, to, uh, with an invitation uh, asking you to support what we're doing by going to our YouTube channel in particular, uh, the Inside News YouTube channel, and uh, connecting with us there. Uh, like it, share it, uh, subscribe, be a member, and help us grow uh, this community. That's what our goal is. We've got about 200 subscribers now. We want 1,000, and you can be one of those, be one of the early people adopting our strategy of building community. Well, as always, we're going to start with uh, hot topics. And today, I uh, just want to acknowledge that today, uh, or this week, is uh, Data Privacy Week. Data Privacy Week, January 22nd through January 23rd. Well, what's that mean? Uh, there's an article uh, that I've got. I'll read you a couple of paragraphs, but you think about how it means, what it means to you. And uh, the notion is that your data is valuable. And uh, it says, even if you don't agree, many organizations and groups would pay top dollar for your data, and they don't all have your best interest in mind. But you have the power to take charge of your data. That's why we are excited to celebrate the second ever Data Privacy Week. Another graph here about this. Uh, the goal of Data Privacy Week is to spread awareness about online privacy. We think that privacy should be a priority for both individuals and organizations. Our goal is twofold. We want to help citizens understand that they have the power to manage their data, and we want organizations uh, to understand why it's important to respect their users' data. So again, uh, Data Privacy Week. Uh, data is important, um, and uh, you can be a data privacy champion. You can learn about uh, what is data privacy. You can uh, get the story about you and data, about respecting privacy and managing your pri privacy settings online. What you want to do is go to staysafeonline.org, and you'll find everything about Data Privacy Week. Well, the next hot topic is uh, one that <clears throat> we talked about a little bit ago last week and uh, an update. Uh, the headline uh, comes from CBS News, uh, WCCO, an article by Rich Chapman, our friend Rich Chapman over at CCO. The headline is that a St. Paul employee, his name is Xavier, Ex Xavier, Xavier Benford Jr. is charged in the St. Paul Recreation Center shooting. And as we mentioned last week, uh, a man who worked, this is brother, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Benford Jr., worked at a recreation center, uh, has been charged uh, uh, in shooting a teenager. Friday, charges were filed in Ramsey County uh, against 26-year-old Xavier Dwayne Benford Jr., one count of second-degree attempted murder and one count of first-degree assault. Both are felony charges. City officials confirmed that he was an employee at Jimmy Lee Recreation Center where the shooting happened. Benford is a community recreation specialist at Jimmy Lee. And so uh, the article by... Uh, Reg Chapman says that, uh, open quote, community relations specialist uh, is the lead point of contact within the Rec Center for programs and day-to-day -day operations, uh, also engagement of young people and just seeing the processes through on a day-to-day -day basis for all center functions. Uh, that quote from Andy Rodriguez, he said that in the Wednesday incident, the 16-year-old victim of the shooting received a gunshot wound to the forehead and was taken to Regents Hospital where he underwent emergency neurosurgery. Surgery. He remains in the intensive care unit with the life-threatening energy, uh, the complaint says. Well, we'll be following. We're wishing uh, him uh, recovery and uh, our, our condolences, I think is the right word, or our um, prayers go out for him and his family uh, and the community. This is a tragic thing. Jimmy Lee Rec Center is like the heartbeat of the community. 
and for something like this to happen and it happens and that Jimmy Lee is across the street from uh, the famous Central High School. And so a lot of children, a lot of young people uh, impacted, affected by this. So um, think about that. Now, uh, let me say to my producer, I'm getting a phone call from Douglas Ewart, who's going to be on the program. Maybe you can reach out to him to help him get connected to the program. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation. I want to go to my first guest, though, and my first guest is going to be my friend Terry Austin. Uh, Terry Austin, how you doing, man? You have to unmute, unmute. Mr. Farland, you're looking great, man. Thank you for having me. Well, I feel great. You look great as well. You know, <clears throat> we talked a little bit ago, and you reminded me that uh, 10 years ago, uh, we did an article on your daughter participating in the father-daughter dance, something that you've been producing and hosting every year for the past 10 years. And it just seemed amazing that that six-year-old is now, what, a 16, 17-year-old, and yeah, see the senior now. Let you know how fast time is whizzing yeah. by me and you, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, I mean, time has went by so fast. It's been unbelievable. Um, just the experience, you know, to to you know to see your daughter and, and you know, as a six year old, just kind of running around, and then now she's a senior in high school, and, you know, getting mm -hmm. ready for college. It's just been an unbelievable experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to do two things. One, uh, Terry, uh, Happy New Year, first of all. You know, congratulations on continuing this work over the past decade. I want to talk about two things. One is the uh, the father-daughter dance, the concept, why you do it, what the value is, what the benefit is for the fathers and the daughters and for the community, <clears throat> what the benefit is for our culture, because I think you're making a statement about who we are and you are uh, disrupting uh, a lot of the negative narratives that there are about who's responsible, who's not responsible, who's accountable, who's not accountable. You are demonstrating something that you think is the true character and the true mission and what more accurately describes who we are and how we show up. That's one. But, you know, the call started with you talking about your daughter. I think it's cool to have, uh, I have daughters. A couple of dads talk about daughters. So that's what we're going to do in the next few minutes. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Okay, well, let's talk first about uh, the event. You know, where did the concept come from? Why did you decide to do it? When, what's your child's name? What's her name? Her name is Taryn. I have two daughters. One, uh, my oldest, her name is Alyssa Austin. Mm -hmm. And then my youngest, which is now a senior, her name is Taryn Austin. So your daughters uh, were participants in the very first father-daughter yes. dance. How did that idea come up? Uh, what, what made that come into existence? Well, to be totally honest, it was my youngest daughter's mother. She has sent me a photo. I mean, she, we co-parent my, my uh, youngest daughter, and she has sent me a photo of three men sitting there on the floor. And it was a photo of three daughters standing up, just gloating over their dad. And she was like, why don't you think about doing a father-daughter dance? Mm. And then I said, uh, I don't know. I had put together a uh, Father's Day event that I did in the summertime to recognize Father's Day weekend, but I'd never done anything at that scope. And then what I, one of the things that I learned, and then I got with Darlene Bell. She had worked for Big Brothers and Big Sisters at the time. And I talked to a few folks that I knew. And then they said, yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. So we just kind of moved forward. And I'll never forget, it was in the middle of the winter time that we did this event and it snowed almost 10 inches that day. And I was getting calls about <laughs> it being canceled. And I was like, I cannot cancel this event. My daughter got her dress hanging up in my room, everything. So I couldn't do it. And we went and we moved forward and we had 150 people hmm. that attended. And now we have over 700 that attend every year. So what was the appeal? appeal? What did you discover uh, your first time out? You were surprised to get 150, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've learned over this course of time that if fathers are asked to do something and they have a space to do it in, you will get an overwhelming response from dads. Hmm. Dads really care about their kids and they want to be involved. 
but they want to be asked to do something. And when they're asked to do it, they always step up and do it. But a lot of times fathers aren't asked to do it or either when they ask, it's in a very demeaning way or, or they don't feel the value that they, that they bring. But when dads feel valued, they will always show up. And so how did you get, um, uh, how many dads were in the first round? How many fathers showed up for that? Well, I just reached out to my network. I found some dads that had daughters first and I started with them and I asked them to find four other dads to come alongside them in this deal. Family members, friends, folks they with work with, church members. And we started with that. Each person was responsible for bringing at least four other people with them. So that's a total of eight and made a total of 10. And then we started with that. And then I eventually started with that network and I branched out. I looked at uh, some church members, some pastors that I knew, they got on board with it. I looked at some schools, they got on board with it. Some other organizations got on board and all of a sudden it became like a snowball effect where so many folks wanted to see their daughters for one, the moms want to see their daughters do it because they probably never experienced that with their father, right? And then the dads were just so excited about having that one-on-one -on -one time with them, especially those fathers that co-parent their kids. They mm -hmm. wanted to have a memory that the other parent couldn't take away. They wanted to be able to have that sacred time with them, that they'll be always uh, building those memories that they can never take away, that, that will last for, forever. What do they tell you? What do, what have some of the, think back over the conversations over the years, and what kind of comments from some of the dads stand out uh, that are easy to put out of your memory? Well, that's a great question. I'll never forget, I think four years ago, I was in Cub Foods in the, in the line, and one of the fathers tapped me on, on the shoulder. I didn't know him, and he was like, you're Terry Austin, you're the guy that, that coordinated the uh, father-daughter thing. He said, man, I just want to tell you that was probably the best event I ever done. And it brought me and my daughter closer together because of that particular event. He said, I needed that moment with her just to bridge and bring us back together because we were so apart and our relationship was damaged. And he needed that. He just needed that moment, those three hours of time, sitting down, getting dressed up, enjoying the music, having the opportunity to dance with his daughter for the first time, mm -hmm. building that closeness and rebuilding their relationship that had been broken down because of miscommunication. And, you know, one side of the family says one thing and then, and then there's the truth in the middle. And then they begin to build their bond. And one of the things that we do at the father daughter dance that's very unique is that we have a covenant reading um, that we all, all the fathers stand up and we have a covenant reading that we do with the dads to their daughter. It's a I promise. Mm -hmm. And so we read that covenant out. There's seven points to it. And, you, and you then got it handy? Do <laughs> you have it handy? Uh, no, I don't. And, and then I wish I did. Yeah, but love was, to hear it. Yeah, so it was one thing that happened that he told me that before his daughter went to bed, she made him reread the covenant to him. Mm. And man, when you talk about I was almost in tears, I was like, man, listen, man, you're giving me too much information. I'm in the line, you know, trying to pay for my groceries and, and then me and him going back and forth. But it was a moment that I'll never forget. Give me another story. One of the things that I find too as well is that I had a father that lived here in uh, Minneapolis. He was a football coach. He worked for the University of Minnesota. Him and his wife had moved here. Um, and he was coaching, got a job. They stayed here for like four years. And he went to the father-daughter dance every year because he didn't get a chance to spend as much time with his daughter as needed during the season. This father-daughter dance gave him that moment that he needed to somewhat reconnect and just continue to build that relationship that he needed with his daughter around Valentine's Day, because we do it around Valentine's Day every year. Mm -hmm. So it's either during the week or it's, it's always on that Sunday. 
And so it gave him an opportunity, man, to buy flowers, to buy candy, to dote her a little bit as well. And to this day, he's in Mississippi right now, him and his wife and kids. To this day, six years later, man, he's still coming to the father-daughter dance. And they make it a, a trip to come back up every year just so that they can enjoy this experience. And so, and I think now she has to be at least 13, at least 15 at this mm -hmm. point. And, and it just gives them a trip to kind of come up to Minneapolis, see some family members, and still have a chance to enjoy that time with his daughter, man. Dan, I can't wait to see him. And, and uh, it's just a wonderful film. Who helps you put this on? You have sponsors in the business community. Uh, if you do, let's give them some credit, some play. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I could not do this without the connection that I have and, 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 and the support I have with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. I mean, they've stepped up to the plate in a space to make sure that these events and, and that we can have a health component added to the event that fathers are aware of some of the resources they pick that they have with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, NAS is involved as well. Uh, we have, you know, so many other different uh, organizations that really take part. Individual, Lewis King has always been a big advocate. Uh, Summit Academy, North Point has always been involved as well. This is just some of, and then not to mention so many different churches. You know, we have New Salem Missionary Baptist Churches. You know, Reverend McAfee has always been one at yep. the forefront, not only in community efforts, man, but he's, you know, he he brings, um, he brings his whole, I think he has like six daughters or either granddaughters, <laughs> and they all come. And, and uh, then they all get out there and dance as well. Like so many other pastors as well, you know, Pastor Herring, we got a Kingdom Life Churches involved. We have so many different pastors that maybe didn't get ex a chance to experience with their daughter, but they bring their daughter and their granddaughter. So this event is open for all ages. So I welcome you, Al. I want to see you there with your daughter and just bring them and just enjoy a time of dinner. Let you know, let them have this last dance with you. And I mean, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's one of those events that uh, really touches your heart. And just to see the little girls with their dad and just to see them grow is something that you'll always remember. Do you do other things uh, that involve uh, parents and children or d dads and daughters through the year? Or is this your signature once a year event? Well, this is a signature event that we're mostly known for. Mm -hmm. The organization that I run is, is a Positive Image. And we put together several events throughout the year. Not only the father-daughter, which happens in February, but we follow that up with some scholarship events that we're doing to recognize some of our student athletes. We're doing a top golf event on April 16th. We're going to follow that up with a men's summit that we're going to do the first part of June. Uh, hopefully we can get the, the uh, location at the Euroc. And we're going to talk about men's health and wealth. So it's going to be a combination of health and wealth as well. And then our other signature event that, that we have been doing for the last 15 years is our Father's Day event that we do the third weekend in June. We have a park that we have out in Central Park and Brooklyn Park. We have all the food. We do some golf as well. And we just have a day where, where the dads and families can kind of come together and eat for free. We have some sponsors that, that I'll jump on board with that as well. And we just have a good time for the whole day, which is on that Saturday. Then on Sunday, we follow it up with a Health Sunday awareness, maybe some prostate for men, blood pressure checks. And, uh, and a light. And then lastly, we have our October event. The moms could not be left out, Al. They wanted to do a mother and son event. So not only do we have a father and daughter, but we have a mother son event that we do every year in October. Um, so the moms have a great uh, opportunity to also enjoy time with their sons. So it's very similar to our father and daughter, but the moms was like, hey, you guys are having way too much fun. We want to be able to have a opportunity like the dads with their daughters to do something with the sons as well. So that's what we have. Terry, uh, talk about Terry Austin. What's your story? How did you come to this work, number one? And uh, talk about your daughters. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, Al. You know, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that um, I've been very fortunate to come from a great family. 
Uh, I'm originally from East Chicago, Indiana. Um, my mom and dad been married for 54 years. Mm. And uh, I grew up in a family where family was everything. And uh, my dad instilled in us that at the end of the day, you have family, but more importantly, if you have kids, they are your number one responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when things did not work out in, in my marriage and in certain relationships that I had, I knew that I, for me, I had one responsibility mm -hmm. and that's to be a great father. And um, just being a great father and just being accountable, showing my daughters the love and care that they needed and instilling a sense of confidence and, and really validation that they need as girls. Um, that they can be strong and, and just setting a, a strong expectation. I had to set apart my own personal relationships just to, to really indulge in them and making sure that, that they had everything that they needed as well. So my work has been about pain in some cases, but it's been, you know, one of the things that I've learned over time is that when you find your purpose in life, and for me, it's been community work. And whatever that is, you just throw yourself in it and just kind of make it work. And when people see that you're passionate about something, you will always find the, the uh, support that you need. You'll find the right people that will get involved and, and, and uh, support you. And I've been very fortunate enough to uh, be willing to ask, be willing to accept no, and then, but 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 just uh, having the fortitude to just keep things rolling. Uh, Chicago to Minnesota. East Chicago, Indiana, East right by Hammond and Gary. <laughs> make, 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 make the distinction, right? <laughs> yeah. East Chicago, yes, indeed. Break that down. I, I got no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> so what what is East Chicago versus Chicago, first of all? Okay. Well, East Chicago is a really small city, not a small city, but we had see, maybe about 40,000. That's really outside of Gary, Indiana, and Hammond. It's, it's, it's the Northwest uh, Corridor of Indiana right before you get to Chicago. So actually I'm only 20 minutes from downtown Chicago, but it's right over the border mm. when you come into Indiana. That's one of the first cities that you'll touch is East Chicago, uh, uh, Indiana. And so as you're going down towards Indianapolis to get to that space as well, you gotta go through East Chicago, Hammond and Gary area to get to Indianapolis. So I always like to make that extension uh, is uh, East Chicago and not Chicago. Right? You mentioned your mom and dad and the family you grew up in, and you were uh, in a family of families. Talk about that. What does family mean to you? Because obviously uh, that has uh, played into how you are approaching your responsibility. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think one of the most important things that I found, and I had, you know, I just turned 50 years of, of age. And one of the most important things that I've learned from my family and my mom and dad is that you know they've been married such a long time and they instill certain principles into uh, us are you, your mom and dad still with you yes my mom and dad are still with us. they just celebrated 54 years of marriage that's right and my my dad he just turned 77 mom is 75. amazing and still in good health and my amazing. mom comes here all the time and so but for me i think the most important thing that i've learned is is that through family, you're going to have some sacrifices that, that you're going to have to make. Um, but I think the most important thing that my, my family instilled in us, specifically my father, is that he, he made sure that we was disciplined as boys. I have two older, I, mean, I have one older brother and one younger brother, but he made sure that we was disciplined as kids and we had responsibility as kids. And we, and we was held at a different level of standard. And my dad, you know, he cared about education, but he cared more about your character as a person and your ability to to serve and not be able or not be afraid to lead and to go into a different path. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I've always been instilled to, you know, if I need to walk alone, sometimes I will. And then, you know, those that want to come on board, I'm happy to have you. But but more importantly, my dad also told me as well, it's who you surround yourself more importantly than than uh, money or anything else, but just surround yourself with the great people. With great people, then you know great things will happen. Terry, I'm I'm way into appreciating and learning about uh, ancestors, uh, my own personal family ancestry, but the whole notion of ancestors uh, in our lives today, what they mean, and the, the sense that 
they are still present. I did an interview with a, a woman who was one of the first women kings in Ghana. Her name was King Peggy. Uh, wow. She was actually here a few years ago I, as my guest a meeting with some elders in our community up at the Urban League. And one thing I remember her saying is that her decision to accept the call to become a king, though that had not happened in her community before, that a woman would be invited to be the king. But uh, the ancestors around her spoke to her and guided her and said that uh, this um, uh, selection was uh, consistent with uh, their role as guides, as spirits, uh, and as family that still is with her even today, generations. Do you think about that? Do you have a sense of your own genealogy of your, your, your um, uh, I'll put it this way. I ask guests often, you know, whose shoulders do you stand on? And, and what do you think when you think about, in your mind's eye, uh, continuity? Well, Al, I think that's a great question. And I want to share something with you too, Al. I don't know if you remember this, but I came over to your office maybe had it been less than 10 years ago. And you had all these artifacts in your office of different mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of, of different places you've been. Mm -hmm. And I remember back in 2016, I was a Bush fellow. And I remember you sharing with me where all these these, you know, artifacts and, and, and uh, just figures in right. your uh, just in your office that you had and you told me exactly where they came from and i remember in 2016 i was a bush fellow and they asked me where would i like to go mm -hmm. and one of the places al that i chose to go was ghana <laughs> Good. and i remember before i went i talked to dr mahmoud el kate mm -hmm. and he gave me directions of what to do and and, and what places to go and the like and i remember it was such uh a validation when I got there. Uh, the first thing they said to me, I remember uh, there were several men that had met us there. And he said, welcome home, King. Welcome home, King. And I was like, wow, unbelievable. <laughs> and so for me, I had to go back to a space. I don't know exactly where my ancestors are from, but I even get it from people that, that are from Ghana that they say I look like I'm a Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that me and my family is going to do this year as well, is to find out exactly where we're from and, and that sort of thing. But I will tell you this, one of the most rewarding spaces I've ever been in was being on the motherland back in Ghana. And, and it gave me such a sense of belonging and a sense of I can do anything when I get back over to the States that I was never going to accept no in, in, as far as a direction to serve. Uh, it, it gave me a different level of vigor, man, when I came back um, to double down on my work and to double down on my efforts and never to accept no. Once I took a look at that ocean and to look at the fact I was at one of the slave castles and I looked at the fact when, when we came out, there was the water. And I said, at some point, my ancestors crossed this, this ocean. If they survive that, there's nothing that I can't accomplish. Man. And I remember, you know, going into that cell that they, you know, the door of no return. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Otis Zanders, which uh, over in St. Paul, and we went with a group of 12 and, and most of the ladies went before to open the door of no return. And I, it was just me and uh, uh, Otis left. And I remember opening the door to, to the door of no return. And I looked out and I said, wow. And something came over me, Al, that I just started to weep mm -hmm. uncontrollably, man, mm -hmm. uncontrollably for like 10 minutes. And uh, when I left there, that's when I knew that my call is to serve and to serve with a different level of bigger more than anyone. What a wonderful uh, testimony, uh, Brother Terry. Look, thank you for being here. Let's let people know how they can uh, participate in the upcoming Father-Daughter Dance. Well, it's going to be on February, Sunday, February 19th at the Earl Brown Center. It's going to start at 4 o'clock. It's going to be dinner. It's going to be dancing. 
It's going to be a award ceremony. It's going to be dance performances. It's going to be dessert. It's going to be a photo booth. It's going to be a packed event for for you to enjoy time with your lovely daughters. And uh, I'm just looking forward to all the fathers in our community to attend and, and just let us celebrate and change the narrative of what they see about fathers in our community. And so I, so Al, I want to tell you again, man, thank you so much. You have a personal invitation to sit with my family uh, if you want to go. And, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon at one of these events. Brother, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, keep up the good work. Let me uh, shift now uh, to uh, the second part of the program. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. And before I bring my next guest, uh, my friend, uh, my, uh, our elder and leader, uh, Douglas Ewart, in uh, a couple of arts notes here, because that'll set the stage for our conversation. One is that uh, one of Penumbra's founding uh, uh, company members, Terry Bellamy, who's part of, a again, a famed arts family, uh, has died at age 70. And this is an article written by a, a fellow Jamaican, uh, Rohan Preston, uh, in the Star Tribune. Uh, the article says that the actor originated uh, roles in the works of August Wilson and helped form the DNA of the St. Paul Theater, that is the Penumbra Theater. And uh, an article, uh, January 22nd, uh, uh, last night published, says that Twin Cities Theater community has lost a titan. Terry Bellamy, gifted actor, director, and unofficial dramaturg, who was part of the famed Bellamy Arts family, died at 70, sometime between Thursday night and Saturday at home in St. Paul. Lane Bellamy, a bassist, and his brother found him unresponsive Saturday after police had been called for a welfare check. Uh, uh, quote, he had COVID and had tried to get help, said Penumbra Theater founder Lou Bellamy, who's 78, uh, and Terry's older brother. Uh, Lou said, I spoke with Terry on Thursday night and he was so sick that we couldn't talk long. I told him to rest and call me in the morning. He did not call. Lou said, I know that he exhausted as many avenues as he could to get help. And I think the healthcare system just failed him. Well, uh, read that article in the Star Tribune. Uh, you can go online and see it. It's an article uh, written again by a fellow Jamaican uh, uh, brother, uh, Rohan Preston. And it's about the death of Terry Bellamy, part of the famed and uh, influential Bellamy organization and family uh, in St. Paul, founders of the uh, Penumbra Theater. So let me continue. I have got a, before I bring Douglas Ewart in, uh, a short video that sets the stage about art, the importance of art. Let's listen to that now. So, um, I'm supposed to talk about how the art saved my life. But the reality is what I'm going to talk about is how not having access to the arts almost killed me. Okay. So I grew up in a, in a very challenging community. It was a drug infested community in the 70s and 80s. It was called Elder and Watson, the block where I grew up. Every street corner had a different drug. It was red top on this block, green top on that block, yellow top on this block, and I'm talking about crack. For those of you who are too young to know about that, they even got creative with the drug names. They called them the president. They even called them untouchables and other names. Good times, good fellas, all types of names. So I had to grow up in a, in a community where I had to basically survive. And that's what it was all about. It was not about education, it was about survival. In the second grade, I was left back. I was held over in second grade because no one took the time to know that I couldn't read. I was an amazing artist, but I couldn't read. So I was held back in the second grade and I was exposed to the arts, you know how? Every time one of my friends was killed, there was a mural painted on the walls. And if you're from the Bronx or if you know about the Bronx, you see those murals on the walls? Each one of them has a story. That's how I was exposed to the arts. So I went through elementary. 
Well, that's how we're going to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Douglas R. Urit, and I've got his bio pulled up to share uh, his story a little bit before we have the conversation. Uh, perhaps best known as a composer, improviser, sculptor, and maker of masks and instruments, Douglas R. Urit is also an educator, a lecturer, an arts organization consultant, and an all-around visionary. I would add to that uh, a pure and natural genius, uh, a gift uh, to our community and to humanity. Uh, in projects done in diverse media throughout an award-winning and widely acclaimed 40-plus year career, uh, Douglas Urit has woven his remarkably broad gifts into a single sensibility that encourages and celebrates uh, as an antidote to the division and compartmentalization afflicting modern life. Uh, and his answer is about wholeness, the wholeness of individuals in culturally active communities. Born in Kingston, Jamaica in 1946, Douglas R. Ewart immigrated to Chicago, Illinois in the U.S. in 19, 1963. His travels throughout the world and interactions with diverse people since then has again and again confirmed his view that the world is an independent entity. An example of his efforts both to study and contribute to this interdependent. I, I said the wrong word. His example of his efforts both to study, uh, I'll come back to that and see. Let, let, me, let me clean it up right now. Uh, I used the word independent entity. I meant interdependent entity, critical, crucial. So uh, uh, I go on to say an example of his efforts to both study and to contribute to this interdependence is his use of his prestigious 1987 U.S. Japan Creative Arts Fellowship to study both modern Japanese culture and the traditional Buddhist uh, shaku achi flute, and also to give public performances uh, while in Japan. Uh, more and more I can go on, but let me stop there and bring in Brother Douglas Ewart. Brother Ewart, uh, good morning. Happy New Year again. How, how you doing, man? Can you hear me? I'm not sure we. I'm, if you're not hearing me. Hello? Yeah, I'm listening for you. Can you hear me? Go ahead and speak. Uh, and Douglas, you're on. We've got a note in the chat to let you know that you are actually on. We hear you. Uh, I just need you to go ahead and speak. And... Uh, so we're having a little challenge with the technology here. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, you know, uh, maybe, uh, Yasmin, you can give a call on the side and get him squared away because we want to have a conversation. In the meantime, I will share more about Douglas Ewart because it's fascinating, uh, his story. Uh, I said, it says that in America, his determination to spread his perspective is part of the inspiration behind is often multidisciplinary works and their encouragement of artists' audience interactions. It is also the basis of teaching philosophy uh, with which he guides his classes at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he has taught since 1990. And it's the basis of the perspectives he has brought to his service on advisory boards for institutions such as the National Endowment of the Arts, uh, Meet the Composer in New York City, and Arts Midwest. Uh, Douglas Ewart uses his past experience as chairman of the internationally renowned Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, AACM, to celebrate and build upon the history and achievements of that organization. Uh, and from this perspective, uh, there's a natural extension of his activities uh, that he's been engaged in for the past four decades. Let me see if we've got audio with uh, Douglas Ewart. We see him, uh, but I'm not sure we have audio yet. We're trying to work that out. And uh, I, I'm looking at him in, in the green room. There we are. So Douglas, we see you, but I don't know. Uh, you have to unmute your microphone. You're on mute.
and you have to if you can find the mute button somewhere on the bottom of your screen usually the bottom left or somewhere or where your name is there's a mute click on that and i should be able to hear your voice then so you're going to still try to work that out yeah okay let me come back to, to douglas uh and you know terry if you're still in in the uh, back you can come back on until we get douglas uh organized again um uh, and what i will do though is continue sharing uh, this awesome story about uh, Douglas R. Ewart. Uh, yeah, as a, uh, <clears throat> let's see, I'll share this. Um, so uh, the bio again goes on to say his administrative teaching and other duties have not prevented him from maintaining several musical ensembles. The Nyabingi Drum Choir, the Clarinet Choir, the Douglas R. Hewitt and Inventions, uh, Douglas R. Hewitt and Quasar, Douglas R. Hewitt and the String Nets, nor has it prevented him from releasing some of the resulting music on his own re record label, Arawak Records, which was founded in 1983 and which has released his Red Hills and Bamtu Bamboo Forest, Bamboo Meditations at Banff, uh, Angels, Angles of Entrance, New Beings, and Velvet Fire. There's more. Uh, Douglas, are you able to, to hear me yet? Or uh, let's see if we can get you in the conversation. So we see you. Got a good image of you. But we, and I, I think you just turned off the uh, the mute. Let's, can you hear me? I'm unmuted. No, you're fine. So I hear you. I hear you and I see you. You sound great. Thank you for being here. But your voice is coming through very slowly and under pitch. Okay, I, I am not sure. That's probably a bandwidth problem. Let me do this. Uh, are you able to see the chat on the side there? Are you able to see the chat on the bottom of your screen? Yes. I'm going to put a note uh, in the chat, and you can respond to the, to the note. So... Um, uh, I'm writing, uh, why is art important? You can go wherever you want to go with that. Uh, are you hearing my frequency good? I hear you perfectly, yes. Okay, well, I'll just take your your lead and we'll just deal with it this way. I can hear you, but it's just slow and at a very low frequency, like, oh, yeah, God. that's okay, awesome. that that that's yeah. a bandwidth problem. Uh, so uh, that's a bandwidth problem. But just watch watch the uh, chat, and I'll okay. type I'll questions to you. Chat for your questions. Yeah. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, always wonderful to be on your program, and it was good to hear the prior uh, speaker and the speak the talk of education and so on. Um, I will look for your questions in the chat, but I wanted to just say something about art. This is a, a recent poem that I wrote. And um, I'll read it to you. Uh, it's, uh, it says, let the people make art. It is life. It gives us light. Let the people make art. It is life. It keeps us sane. Let the people make art. It is life. It helps us to care. Let the people make art. It is life. It helps us to be passionate and compassionate. Let the people make art. It helps us to feel and express love. Let the people make art. It is life. Let the people make art. It is life. Let the people make art. It is life. Art is the blood of life. Art is the art of life. 
Art is the brain of life. Art is the soul of life. Let the people make art. It is life. Great. Yasmin, I think you can actually put my questions on under the crawl so you can read them under the channel. If you uh, uh, make a banner or brand uh, announcement and he can see as opposed to trying to lean into. So there's the question. Uh, Douglas, are ancestors present in the world and how? I think that the ancestors are always with us. You know, the nearest ancestors we have are our parents, of course, and their parents and their parents and so on. It's, we're part of a continuum. And I heard the prior speaker speak about education and education starts with home. Education is not um, from going to a building and going to what we call school. It's part of that. However, I think the greater part of education starts and is propelled us from what we get in that foundation at home. Of course, some people don't have that possibility. And so school is a crucial platform for them. But as I think about my own trajectory trajectory and development i think of my grandparents in particular um, and on both sides particularly my grandmothers who i knew better than i knew my grandfathers my grandfathers of course had impact and um, my um, Maternal grandparents were Garveyites, and I recently found their documents from 1920 when they were already members of the Universal Improvement Association. Um, so those things, you know, sometimes you think that you've arrived at a certain development on your own, but you realize there are lots of things that have impacted you along the way that you sometimes are not even cognizant of. And so we were raised in that atmosphere of feeling and knowing in, internal confidence, not arrogance, but feeling good about oneself, um, knowing that Africa was an advanced country, a continent, I should say, and um, so that you were never, no one could ever make you feel less than who you are and what you are and what we've contributed to world civilization and what we've continued to do in terms of the development of world civilization in spite of all the um, obstacles that have been placed in our paths. So yes, education begins at home uh, and that internal confidence is a crucial aspect aspect of one's uh, future and one's development and sometimes it's not necessarily your parents or or guardians immediate guardians but the community that impacts you because some people don't have that legacy of having uh, parents or parents that are the most illustrative for you, but we get it from people we meet along the way. And even with parents, you still need community uh, contribution and it helps to accelerate um, who you are and what you become. And one of the things that the elders would say to you and uh, the brother before mentioned it is show me you know, who you associate with, and I can tell you quite a bit about what kind of character you're most likely to have. So there's another question in the chat there for those who are listening. Uh, I put two questions in there. Uh, in your mind's eye, do you contemplate the origin of creation? And I ask you this as an artist, uh, 
And do you contemplate your personal relationship to the creation? The creation? Yes. Um, you know, the, that's the, the, the note. The note is at the bottom. Okay. In your, in your mind's eye, do you contemplate the origin of creation itself and, and also contemplate your personal relationship to creation? I often contemplate it. It is such a, <laughs> a formidable <laughs> uh, concept in terms of, you know, how do you think about the creation? How do you think about the creator or creators uh, having grown up in a Christian climate where this notion of God was, you know, um, a man and someone that's constantly observing the world. I don't know if I can really adhere to that principle about life. I, I, this is my, the way I deal with the creation and is that it's something beyond the beyond of the beyond. <laughs> and it's something that I can only harness it by thinking about my relationship to people and to the planet that I'm supposed to be good, kind, considerate, compassionate, and that goes not just for people, but to animals and the planet itself. There's this concept that if you don't know um, in this climate or in certain climates, if you don't know a certain prophet or if you don't know a certain um, uh, supposed messiah, you can't enter the kingdom. Well, I won't get to the kingdom because I ain't doing that. <laughs> uh, my is if, if being kind and thoughtful and generous is not sufficient, then what happens to the people that don't know about certain philosophies and certain notions about what is supposed to be? And so my relationship to um, the creation is to be thankful, to share, to care, to be considerate. I don't know any way, other way to be about this. And of course, I look at, I've looked at many philosophies, Christian, uh, Islam, Buddhist, Hindu, Jainism, Zoroastrianism, uh, Santeria, Candomblé, um, Shango, Obia, all of these ph philosophies are valid to me because they're about caring for people. And so what we've come into into this um, culture is that there is that one form of religion is better than the other one. I can't see it like that, especially when I think about the fact that I am an African and um, I have been influenced by Africa. Uh, and the philosophies that have developed, many of them came from Africa and were, uh, you know, changed over time and to incorporate other notions about creation and about, um, you know, cre the creator or creators. And for me, you know, the creator has to be uh, multifaceted multi-dimensional and i can't just be a guy because um you know or a man I, I have to see a woman in that pantheon and i tend to be more into the idea of a pantheon rather than an individual entity or force but the force the greater force is creation itself and i think it's difficult to um to capsulize that, no matter how visionary we may be. But ultimately, it's how do we treat each other, to me, that's crucial. Um, my maternal, my paternal grandmother used to say to us, if you have, 
you have enough to share. Mm. And that's how she lived in terms of sharing with neighbors. She was a devout Anglican. And my other grandmother was a devout Seventh-day Adventist. And, um, you know, I, I, of course, grew up with that impacting me because they went to church regularly mm -hmm. and we were indoctrinated in the Bible mm -hmm. and so on. So I can't say that those things have not influenced my life, but so has Baha'i and some of the other uh, foregoing uh, notions that uh, our philosophies or religious uh, tenets, procedures, concepts that I've mentioned before. So yeah, the, 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 the idea of creation is, um, is mind boggling to me, you know, what, how, what was the first thing that happened? How did we come to this complexity? Um, how does one look at God um, it, when you think about the kinds of atrocities that goes on in the world uh, and people will say it's God's plan. And so it's difficult for me to look at God in that sort of notion um, as, as in, a, in a great way, a voyeur <laughs> that watches all these crazy things happen and never intervenes. And, um, you know, when I think about, for example, slavery and how that went on and, you know, um, yeah, those things made me as a young man, by the time I was about 11, these questions were very perplexing and still remain that to me. Um, you know, what, what are humans doing? What, what are we doing? How do we play into um, how we behave with each other? How, how do we deal with some of the kinds of um, deception and viciousness and partisan politics that we're facing in the U.S. right now um, with gun violence and and you know you, you not want not wanting to to look at the illogical nature of our our so-called laws and the Supreme Court, even the name displays a kind of arrogance to me because mm -hmm. there's nothing about <laughs> about man. <laughs> I can you know, when you look at the, the kinds of things that the Supreme Court vote, votes on or rules on, uh, like not outlawing bun stacks and uh, bunt stocks and um, and you know the the logical nature of that and what it causes that almost weekly we have um, a mass shooting that's um, fostered. Brother, we're, 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 Brother Douglas, we're out of time. We're out of time, but this has been wonderful. I had a couple <laughs> of notes in the chat for you, uh, but let's come back and do this again. This is the beginning. Uh, the note I had was that uh, you know we are improvising. We are. Uh, dealing with the uh, curveball being thrown by the technology uh, at the moment, but we got it going. I'm Al McFarland. This is the conversation with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time.